Hi everyone, this is Ben Esgro again from De Novo Nutrition, and uh, this is going to be the first in a series of, I guess you could say, educational PowerPoints, uh, presentations, uh, just some hot topics uh, I feel in either the nutrition or training or kind of the marriage of the two. So today is going to be about metabolism, um, since it is now a very hot, to hot topic. Uh, thank you to Dr. Norton's um, YouTube video. So I kind of wanted to do uh, somewhat of a follow-up on it and just kind of describe it, uh, I guess, in a different manner and maybe a more theoretical perspective on it um, because I've been getting questions, again, thanks to Dr. Norton, <laughs> um, on um, what exactly a blunted metabolism is, um, how you repair it, uh, if you can repair it, and stuff like that. So um, hopefully this is uh, interesting and kind of a at least lets you recognize what exactly it is if you do potentially have um, metabolic issues. And uh, really what you'll see on the next slide is, is just kind of to stimulate thought. So like I said, um, the main thing that I really intend to do with this presentation is just kind of get you thinking um, about uh, really all the things that you need to factor into uh, not just science or um, research, but just things that you know have an effect on on you as an individual when you're dieting or exercising or anything like that uh, just because there's so many factors that go into it and, and unfortunately um, in this area a lot of people tend to kind of isolate um, different pathways or different different thoughts uh, and, and tend to really overemphasize the importance of certain things and they lose sight of the big picture so that's a, a major intention of this is, is to really hopefully help people appreciate um, the big picture of physiology. Uh, and then two things that are really just disclosure that I have to mention before I start is this this is not going to be entirely uh, scientific based citations and everything like that um, just because some of the stuff we we know it happens but there really isn't that much literature and you're not going to find much funded literature on bodybuilding competitors um, there is literature on different eating disorders and metabolism, um, which again, some of this information is going to be pulled from and applied to a different scenario. Uh, it's also certain, you know, just case studies on myself and my own prep or helping clients out, um, and basically just my scientific background, um, you know, from my education, basically applying those concepts to... Uh, uh, the con those concepts of physiology to, to try to explain some of these phenomena that are happening um, during uh, extreme exercise or extreme cal caloric restriction. And again, just a medical disclosure that this is, is really, this is not to replace any medical advice or you know, act as any kind of prescription for anybody with a specific medical condition. So, uh, how are we going to attack this? Before I even get into talking about metabolism, the one thing, or the two things I really want to go over are interpretation um, and application of research. So basically using research, research uh, how it's intended to be used or how it should be used. Uh, just because, again, this is something that has become a lot more popular with people uh, really in, in the bodybuilding uh, realm who also are scientists and then there's kind of you know the the battle between those who are more experience based and those are who are more academic based and there seems to always be a clash um, so this is, is just kind of just a preface again before I get into this material because it is important stuff to mention because there will be some scientific discussion in this presentation um, and then another one which is again it's sort of a presentation within a presentation, um, which is, I, I just wanted to mention something that I've really noticed in my own formal nutrition education, um, which is trying to use uh, silver bullet theories 
to solve problems, uh, really like physiological issues. Um, and this is something you do see, I think it's popular because of, of pharmaceutical intervention. Um, we try to, you know, like ablate a certain pathway or response in physiology uh, when there's so many other things it can, it can kind of affect. So uh, again, something that's important to mention before I actually start talking about metabolism, um, because metabolism is tied into all of these things. Then I will actually define uh, metabolism so everybody kind of can have a working understanding of what it is I'm talking about because I think sometimes people mention metabolism and it's just kind of you know like a, a popular word and uh, people don't fully understand what that exactly means. Uh, so then we'll kind of get more into the things that affect metabolism uh, and then again like I said some of the theoretical things I wanted to bring up um, things again I've noticed myself with intervention and again just basically rationale for certain ideas that I've had just because I can't fall asleep because I think about these things so much so I'm so obsessive compulsive I kinda just really wanted to get this information out there and again if if nothing more it, it makes other people think about this and um, spurs some more uh, in-depth thought on the, on the matter so first let's talk about interpretation and application of research um, so basically, the main reason research even exists is to try to explain things that we don't necessarily know the explanation for. Um, so we're, you know, we're searching for the answers, or we're searching for an explanation of why something happened. Uh, so the purpose of research is not to generate irrefutable fact. Um, so sometimes, if if you become purely science-based, you can start to think that something that's never been studied uh, is, you know, you basically can't, you know, you can't generate hypothesis through experience. And I think that that's too far to one extreme, and I also think purely experience-based is too far to one extreme. So you kind of have to appreciate um, research for what it's done for and realize that, just like everything, there, there's, there's limits, um, there's boundaries of, you know, how far you can apply this and also how far you can apply experience-based stuff. So basically a marriage of the two is very important. Um, and another really important thing is, is nothing should really be outright accepted or denied. I know that's something that can be very tempting if you read you know, a study or an abstract and it, and it comes to an outcome that you really feel strongly about, um, but it, it should definitely be scrutinized and and try to separate your bias um, when you scrutinize uh, research. That's something that might be more for um, those who are in academia, I guess, because I, I really do want to make this for everybody, um, like a very varying crowd. So I don't want to lose anybody who's just um, you know just wanted to was interested in listening to this who doesn't want to hear you know all pure science-based discussion but I also want to you know make it interesting for science science-based individuals as well um, this is really the way I, I see it um, is that you should use research as a compass so you should use it for direction or guidance on something so basically if if you're looking for an explanation on something that you fully, you know, haven't figured out or something that you're just looking for more in-depth answers, definitely look to the research because it will give you direction. Or if, if you're trying to apply something new that you've never applied, research is strength in numbers. If it's been done before in research, it should help you get some answers as where to start. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the one and only way to go about things. Um, so as I said here, as I put it, um, it it's, it's one cog in the decision-making wheel of knowledge application. Um, so again, there's a place definitely for experience-based um, stuff as well. It's just that you can't get lost in one or the other. And just recognize bias. Um, and really, bias is kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, without bias, I think research might not even exist because people get so in you know ingrained in, in, in these or so involved in these questions that they want answered 
that's kind of a good bias because these are the people who are, are really trying to find out these answers. But at the same time, if you become too biased, um, you can, again, get lost in, in your purpose and might start to accept things that um, may be flawed or just may be, it may be too early to fully accept them. So hopefully that was, you know, just interesting for people to, you know, again, And the next one it does kind of go uh, hand in hand, and again, this is another reference uh, I like to make, or just kind of um, comparison to a, an, an outside situation that's not scientific. Um, and that is uh, that physiology is is generally like Times Square on New Year's Eve. So when I say that, what I mean is um, physiology is is busy. There's really not you know, any one thing going on at once, it's a whole bunch of reactions happening um, that, you know, helps us stay alive and function and, and really thrive. Um, so the, it's just, you know, if you ever watch, it's actually pretty appropriate because it's almost New Year's now, but if you ever watch it on TV, um, you see there is just a lot going on. Uh, and that's really how physiology uh, happens. I mean, you have, you know, neuroscience, you have endocrinology, you have uh, everything going on. So it really is something that needs to be appreciated. Um, so in that respect, uh, attempting to solve an entire condition, a uh, medical condition, or you know something that might not be totally medically recognized like this metabolic discussion I'm about to have, um, Attempting to solve it by isolating one component, it really is short-sighted. Um, and it is ignorant because you're not appreciating the spillover that that may have if you totally, like I said before, obliterate some kind of response in one pathway. Um, so there is, there is a lot of intertwining in metabolism that needs to really be appreciated, and just in physiology in general. And that really can be noted by the amount of side effects in a lot of pharmaceuticals. Um, so again, you know, it's something to really bear in mind. And again, in the same token, um, an organism, a person you're treating, you're trying to help, uh, and a deviation from the norm. So specifically in this scenario, we'd be talking um, hypometabolism versus normal metabolism. Um, it must be considered holistically. So you need to consider all of the things that are factoring into that state of hypometabolism, not just um, things that are directly affecting it. So if someone has an eating disorder, you can't just say, okay, you know, start to eat. Um, you need to factor in psychological issues and uh, physical activity issues and everything else like that. So um, when you try to just isolate something, it's, it's, it's almost like totally losing the respect of somebody as a human um, just because as we all know life does not exist in a vacuum um, so some really good examples that are really popular things in nutrition anybody who has gone through a, uh, an academic a formal you know nutrition track you will have heard these before and these are really good examples of silver bullet theories that just um, you know, do not really hold their water, so like salt restriction to um, resolve hypertension. Um, obviously that is not the only problem that's making people be hypertensive, um, and it's losing sight of people who are probably obese also, which is an exerting, exerting an effect on their, you know, blood, ve blood vessels. So, um, again, that, that's a really good example of silver bullet theory, only looking at one, you know, potential cause for something and trying to just totally exploit it. Um, fat reduction uh, to resolve cardiovascular disease, that's a pretty epic fail, um, and saturated fat to avoidance to resolve cardiovascular disease. There are actually, um, I know some people who might be listening to this who have heard otherwise or been taught otherwise and uh, really haven't been inclined to dig into the research. There is actually a lot of uh, excellent research that um, speaks otherwise and um, yeah, so, again, I don't want to get too far off track with that. We can make more videos, I guess, if we want in that regard, but, uh, again, just appreciate that 
uh, removing one component isn't going to solve a problem when, when there's a myriad of factors that, that go into it. So let's uh, get into the topic at hand. Uh, so what exactly is metabolism? So to simply define it, it would just be the sum of chemical reactions that are, that are taking place in the body. But that really is far too simplistic, uh, just because it does need to be appreciated um, how many uh, different pathways there are and, and reactions that are taking place. So one thing that really is central to metabolism is uh, ATP, so our cellular fuel, um, and ATP flux. Uh, that's really something that's central to metabolism. The next slide, I'm really going to try to give a better appreciation of that and hopefully not um, lose anybody. I want to really try to make it understandable for everybody. Uh, but that's something, that's why there are the two stars there. Um, that's something that you really need to recognize is uh, energy availability is uh, very important to metabolism and ATP is really where, where one commonality between everything in metabolism. Um, and again, like I said, it involves tons of different pathways and they, <coughs> again, they, they, they directly involve either production or utilization of ATP and then production of different metabolites. So uh, something, uh, just to give a couple examples, uh, so we have the Krebs cycle, which we're using to make ATP. Um, that's a popular metabolic uh, pathway. We, we can have metabolism of amino acids, of uh, hormones, all of these things where you generate metabolites. Um, and they can be exergonic or endergonic. So like I said before, they can consume ATP or they can create uh, energy. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say about that, but if I do have a, a thought that comes in, I will revisit that. Um, but again, like I said, metabolism is, is a lot more integrated and um, interconnected than, than just saying the sum of chemical reactions. So this is something that uh, might be new to uh, some of the people listening, um, AMP kinase. So basically when you have, like I said before, you have this fuel for cells which is uh, ATP. ATP can be broken down further because what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to utilize those phosphates. Um, so you can actually ATP is the adenosine triphosphate, so you have three phosphates um, attached to this, this, this backbone molecule. You can actually hydrolyze or break off um, two of those, and you can get it down to AMP. And AMP is really the switch that's recognizing, um, or AMP kinase, which is an enzyme, is, is the switch that's recognizing um, that there's not much ener energy left now, because if you have a lot of this AMP, then you really can't take any more off of this of this molecule that's that's really trying to to get energy. Um, it's almost like a, a energy carrier. Think of it like an energy train. It's taking phosphate. It's actually picking up and, and letting go of phosphate um, <coughs> to provide energy between all of these pathways. And um, so what happens with with AMP kinase when that actually gets signaled is it it shuts off anabolic things that are going to consume ATP. So, uh, like I have down here, when the switch is off, you actually have stimulation of things that consume ATP. So protein synthesis, cell growth, stuff like that. Stuff that, any kind of anabolic stuff is going to take ATP. Um, and you inhibit catabolic things. So, um, because you have the energy available, uh, again, you can build up stuff. When ATP, AMP kinase is switched on, that means you don't have a lot of energy available. So what you're trying to do is basically go through all these metabolic pathways and create more energy. So you're going to start oxidizing fats, so you know adipose tissue, um, you're going to, uh, you're not going to do anything with anabolic, so you're not, actually cholesterol synthesis is something that takes excess ATP. So um, you're not going to make more cholesterol. That's why you can improve your cholesterol levels by, by exercise or caloric restriction. Um, 
protein synthesis is going to be shut off. Making fats is going to be shut off. Again, these things are, are ATP consuming processes. Uh, this pathway to the right is um, not as important for this discussion. It is important. It, it's, it's the protein synthesis pathway and how leucine affects it. Um, again, that's something I have to thank uh, Dr. Norton for really educating me on, um, and, and Gabe Wilson, and Jake Wilson. <laughs> um, but anyway, something that really, you know, can be appreciated with this outside of discussing um, metabolism and, and metabolic blunting and hypometabolism is um, when you look at this, one thing that hopefully can be appreciated is, is why lean mass gains and fat loss are not occurring at the same time. Um, because you're really not, you can't cheat the system. Um, when you have activation of AMP kinase, it, it's, it's sensing that you need more ATP. So it's not going to divert it towards building muscle because you have a lot of other processes that are important for survival before, you know, getting an inch on your biceps. <laughs> um, so this is also why some of the things that happen uh, during, during extreme dieting or chronic uh, restriction or chronic activation of AMP kinase um, through dieting happens, such as some of the people experience uh, endocrinology, endocrinology issues, um, so low libido, stuff like that. Again, this stuff all takes energy. It all takes ATP to make it function. So things are going to shut off that are, uh, again, a little bit lower on the totem pole for survival. Um, the other thing that I also wanted to mention with this is uh, you can have, again, like exercise and certain different nutrients uh, can acutely activate this. So actually AMP kinase, um, it is important for certain, AMP kinase activation is important for certain responses, uh, but again, there's a major difference between acute physiological response and chronic physiological response. Um, so actually some a lot of the benefits uh, from exercise, like I increased glucose uptake um, through GLUT4 signaling, stuff like that, that all is, is happening through uh, AMP kinase activation. Um, stuff like body composition, again, if you just look at um, what inhibition and stimulation of AMP kinase does, you can appreciate that obviously it's, it's very closely tied to um, body composition. So um, hopefully that's just, just something that uh, I'm hopefully cleared up a little bit for people, but again, it, it is important to the discussion. So, uh, what kind of things affect metabolism? So, we'll talk more on kind of the, the macro level, the, the broad-based level of this. Um, instead of, I'm not really going to talk about any more pathways, so that might be a, a breath of happiness for some people. Um, but the things that you really can't control that affect metabolism are things like height, age, sex, and certain endocrinological, endocrin, not, I can't say it, endocr <laughs> endocrinology um, conditions or uh, different hormone levels. Again, this is assuming no pharmaceutical interventions taking place. Uh, obviously, if you replace it with a pharmaceutical, then you can restore um, normal levels. And one of the important things, which I have a picture of here, is, is thyroid hormone. Um, that does control a lot of metabolic things. Same thing with um, a popular hormone, which is leptin, um, and certain other adipose-derived hormones. Um, so, really, again, I don't want to focus on that too much because we can't control it. But things we can control, assuming drug-free, um, are physical activity. Um, weight and lean body mass and our food and our macronutrient intake. So it's really, it, it's not just food, it is actually macronutrients too, um, but the primary thing there that's a factor is, is energy. Uh, but one thing I do want to note here is actually, and, and I might note this again later, um, that actually the majority of basal metabolic rate um, is highly correlated with lean body mass. So um, the more you have, the higher metabolic rate is going to be, and things that are all tied into um, benefits, things that are going to benefit metabolism, are all things that relate to lean body mass. 
So uh, let's briefly talk about the, the pathology of, of hypometabolism. So uh, how does this occur? How do we actually uh, blunt our metabolic rate? Uh, so it, it's actually occurring because it's a survival mechanism um, induced that's secondary to, to chronic and excessive energy restriction. So if you are, if you do two days of really low calorie dieting, um, or fasting, you are not going to have a blunted metabolism. Um, this is these responses take time. Um, again, so that's something that I, I really want to highlight through this, and and I will continue to in, in the next couple of slides. Um, and it is something that is dependent, uh, just like I have here on the bullet, on um, the length of exposure and the margin of deficit you subject yourself to. Um, so, in other words. The longer you keep calories really low, the more severe your blunting of your metabolic rate is going to be, and the lower you drop calories, the more severe the blunting of your metabolic rate is going to be. Um, the other thing, too, is it's not just caused by this one single factor. So it can actually be caused by excess exercise. It can be caused by excess caloric restriction, eating disorders, so just really not eating or starving yourself, like um, anorexia or bulimia, um, really extremes of, of, of energy deficit, or it could just be a combination of all of them. And uh, another important thing to recognize as, is that recovery from this, uh, it can be lengthy. So um, understand that it's something that takes place due to a, a chronic exposure and it is something that takes place to or, or takes time to attempt to heal. So here's some of the uh, external effectors on BMR. So again, like I said, one thing that really should be appreciated here is they are all intimately tied to muscle mass. Um, so things that actually positively impact BMR are things that are pro-lean body mass. So resistance exercise, um, lifting. We know for a fact lifting does stimulate the accretion of lean muscle mass. That will increase your BMR. Caloric surplus. I will get into that a little bit of why that increases BMR. Uh, again, positive nitrogen balance basically means you know you you can have anabolism. Um, you have more you know lean body mass, more somatic protein. Uh, that's going to that's going to benefit metabolism. Uh, things like endurance, excessive endurance, aerobic exercise, uh, again, like I noted, caloric restriction, uh, negative nitrogen balance, things that are actually negative regulators of muscle mass, they are going to blunt, they're going to make your metabolism slower. So, uh, how can we attempt to prevent this when we diet um, for, for competitors chronically? Um, or for contest, or for just general people who want weight loss, um, how can we try to avoid hypometabolism? Uh, so, like I noted in the beginning of the presentation, the primary focus really has to be energy intake. That's first and foremost. Really doesn't matter how you break up macros. If you are starving yourself, you are going to have a blunted metabolism. Um, so, the slower and and less you restrict, the better. Uh, time, I really cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, time is something you just simply cannot make up for. If you try to diet on a time frame that is just too short um, to, to reach a realistic expectation, a realistic goal, you are going to run the risk of, of impairing your metabolism far more than if you give yourself enough time. So what I mean by that is if you're somebody who wants something yesterday, um, and you diet on, you're trying to lose 30 pounds in 5 weeks or 10 weeks, uh, you are going to run a much greater risk. And again, something, one of the reasons of this is you are going to run a much greater risk of losing lean body mass. That is part of the equation here. Um, the next thing I'll get into is uh, actual metabolic pathways of, of why there might be blunting occurring. But um, loss of lean body mass is definitely going to be one of the major things that's going to it's going to hurt you, going to hurt your metabolism, and it's going to um, really hurt your body composition and just not really make the whole experience fun. Uh, 
an undulating of pattern of fat and carbs uh, it may be beneficial. There's there's a number of factors why I included that on here. Um, again, it must be individually tailored. Uh, so what that means is uh, it is actually recognized that not everybody can tolerate the same absolute carbohydrate amounts. We do have genetic differences um, in our ability to tolerate carbohydrates and insulin sensitivity and, and all those things kind of factor in. Um, but one simple reason for this is because it, it really can minimize uh, attrition and it can make a diet uh, a lot more varied. So if you, and what I mean by undulation of, of fat and carbs is if you have something I do with clients is I do normal days and high days uh, in, in relation to carbohydrates. So on a normal day what I'll do is I'll give them a better distribution of fat and on a high day I'll give them a higher distribution of carbohydrates. So it's not really static. They're not low fat all the time. They're not low carb all the time. Um, protein is something that I do keep more at, at sort of a baseline level. Um, again there are reasons for this but I don't want to get too too far into that. Um, but, but undulation can, can make things uh, a little bit um, easier for people and again it can promote greater variety. Uh, if you've listened to any of my other videos that is something I am a big fan of. Uh, obviously this is, this is capitalized so this is one of the most important things I wanted to, to get across in the slide is that you should eat as much as you can while still making progress. So if you're losing weight really fast eat more. If you are not losing weight, drop. you can drop a little bit, but drop it slow. Do not get overzealous. Don't get ahead of yourself. Don't, um, don't play mind games with yourself. Uh, you need to be conservative with this. Uh, because again, as you approach lower and lower and lower levels, you run the risk of this much greater, and the other thing too is at a certain point you get you get to a point of where you can't take away anymore, and that's where the problems really start to present themselves. So, um, if this does happen, uh, how would we go about uh, repairing this? Um, so, again, the, one of the important things is, is to treat the underlying. Um, issues that are occurring. Uh, so my view on, on this, uh, why this is happening from really an, an adaptation perspective outside of losses of lean body mass is, uh, again, what this is why I went into the background on those first couple slides, because um, I said this was going to come back up again. Um, metabolism relies upon enzyme activity. Enzymes are proteins. When you starve yourself or you don't have the energy available, you reduce your stimulus um, to use these, these enzymes. So basically it's just like muscle mass. If you don't stimulate it, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it because it's metabolically expensive. If your body thinks you're starving and you're going to die, it's going to get rid of things that you're not using. So if you reduce the stimulus, you degrade proteins, you degrade enzymes. So what happens? You have less enzymatic activity, you have less body protein, you have a blunted metabolism. So how do you repair this? Well, this is one thing that we do know about enzymes. Enzymes are inducible. Um, so a really, really easy to think of example of this is um, when you start drinking alcohol. Uh, the first time you ever drink, or if you don't drink much, you're going to get drunk really quickly. Uh, what happens if you become a chronic alcoholic? I don't mean to take that turn um, for the worst there, but um, you know, for example purposes, uh, you actually can induce those enzymes that um, that oxidize uh, ethanol. So, and, and they're actually the uh, they're liver enzymes. They're uh, cytochrome P450, and they are inducible by um, ethanol. So what actually happens to an alcoholic is they can tolerate more alcohol because this is a response by subjecting themselves to this very continually. So uh, again, something to really appreciate about physiology is physiology is very, very adaptable. Um, but again, this takes time. So the first time you drink, you're not going to noticeably have more alcohol dehydrogenase. 
um, or you know cytochrome P450 to, to metabolize this stuff. It's going to take time. If, if you continually subject yourself to alcohol, you will have a better tolerance. So this is something that actually um, can apply, obviously not with alcohol, but um, with food intake. If you continually subject yourself to slightly higher amounts, you will actually induce the production of those enzymes that you've broken down previously. Um, and your metabolic rate will start to recover. But again, this takes time if you want to not gain excessive fat um, doing it. So really time and, and control are the two biggest factors here. Um, and what's going to factor into this, this amount of time is going to be, again, how low you went with calories, how long you subjected yourself to these low calories, um, and a couple other things I'm going to talk about. Um, but. But yeah, that that's really my, my theory is um, uh, on on the whole metabolic um, kind of blunting. So the other component we have for um, things that you need to consider when you're dieting, uh, trying to lose fat mass, is um, physical activity. So again, assuming that you start with a normal metabolism, how do we really minimize the risk of this occurring um, when we diet. Uh, so first things first, you should remain, you should keep the highest specificity to your goals, to your outcomes, either physique-wise or um, a a in athletic performance. Uh, so that means if you're a lifter, you should lift more often. The other important thing about lifting is lifting is a lot more tied to increases in muscle mass. Endurance running is not. This picture is excellent at highlighting that. Um, you will never see Lance Armstrong in a muscle magazine ad. There's a reason for that, because it's not a stimulus for muscle mass. That really needs to be appreciated. Um, so, when it comes to cardio, it should only be added when and if it's necessary. Um, so, if you're a lifter, doing cardio six, seven days a week, and you're lifting five days a week, you have a problem with balance. You need to apply specificity here. Uh, there are actually some, some excellent studies on uh, metabolic rate in, in actually twins. So same, actually, same genes, uh, and they subjected them to energy restriction or to um, to try to induce the same amount of, of energy restriction through endurance exercise, like treadmill running. And they actually found that the individuals who did the treadmill running had a lower BMR uh, after, at, at the end of the intervention, than the people who actually just adjusted their, their energy intake. Um, there is actually a lot more data on this um, in, in relation to muscle hypertrophy and stuff like that. So endurance exercise, um, if you're not a marathon runner, then then why are you doing so much of it? Uh, so something you should really consider instead is increase your lifting frequency instead of increasing your cardio frequency. Again, you want to be a better lifter. You should lift more often. That's like a baseball pitcher driving a race car to get better at pitching. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so again, something that's really important to note here is don't get overzealous when you reach a plateau. Uh, so what I really mean there is, like a, a common thing when you start dieting is to reduce 500 calories a day, uh, create a deficit of 500 calories a day, because theoretically what you're going to cause is um, 3,500 calorie deficit by the end of the week, and a pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So what someone might think is, oh, I haven't lost weight in a week or two weeks. I need to reduce another 500 calories. No, not a good call because you actually are still in a deficit. So what you need to do is be conservative. Um, this is somewhere where I really need to highlight the importance of seeking out somebody who's qualified to help you. Uh, because if you do this on your own, you are going to keep burning the candle at both ends. You will definitely run the risk of having metabolic issues if you just keep chopping away at the calories or start adding in a ton more exercise. 
So uh, I have to say I love this picture. I found it when I was uh, making this slideshow, and it is probably the most appropriate picture uh, I've potentially ever seen for, for this presentation. Um, but something that's really important to note is that overexercise is just as big a factor as over-restricted intake. So if someone is, if you're working with someone to help you improve or um, repair this metabolic issue, don't try to make up for it by exercising more. That is not going to help the situation. You're just going to end up being frustrated. So one thing you need to accept is you might take a slight step backwards in body comp to, Im to improve your metabolism and get it back to um, a normal level. So um, again, don't think that you're going to get uh, quote unquote shredded when you reverse dieting uh, to improve your metabolism. Um, you, you need to be realistic and rational with these things. There's much more important things to work on if, if that's your main issue at that point. Um, so another thing that I really do highly suggest is to dramatically reduce or eliminate low intensity cardio bouts and to keep your lifting frequency. Again, what you're trying to do here is trying to be specific to things that increase or will keep your metabolic rate um, up and, uh, you know, try to help you build lean mass or things that, again, are going to work towards improving your metabolic rate, not things that are going to either blunt it or, you know, have kind of a null effect. Um, so an important thing also to note with that is... Uh, that you should be utilizing periodization. Um, again, this is something that, that could potentially be a whole other topic, um, but, and this also kind of goes hand in hand with the last bullet point, which is training hard, but training smart. Um, so if you're training all the time, you know, as they say, balls to the wall or hardcore, uh, it's going to be really hard, and you're going to have other stress issues, uh, again, thinking of it in a holistic perspective, um, so in, in kind of the psychological domain of things, uh, it's, it's not going to help. It's only going to further compound things. Uh, if you're already on really low calories, you're training to failure all the time, um, you know, you're not undulating your pattern of intensity throughout the week. Um, so a name that comes to mind when I think of this uh, is because of daily undulating periodization. Mike Zordos, get in touch with him, he'll solve your training problems. <laughs> so uh, that's really the gist. Hopefully uh, that was informative and interesting for everybody. Um, but a few things that I really want to end with, uh, so if you didn't get anything from the last 20, 25 minutes, however long it was, listen to this slide. This is the important stuff that I want you to take away. Um, you can't make up for lost time. If you're trying to lose 20 pounds of fat in less time than it is feasible, you will have, th there's going to be repercussions for that. Um, so, if you think you need 15 weeks to diet, give yourself 20. Give yourself some time padding. Don't try to, again, be hardcore, squeeze things into a, t a, s a short time frame. It's just not going to work out well. I've seen it. I've seen it, you know, repeatedly. It just doesn't end pretty. Um, if you're unsure of your abilities, again, like I said, get help from someone qualified. Uh, there are, you know, every day there's there's more and more competent coaches coming out, hopefully to combat the ones who aren't qualified um, to really be doing it and who's, who are actually partly to blame for causing, you know, this hypometabolic state of so many people. Um, so... If, if, if you see someone, if you feel someone's doing this, someone is starving you and they keep, uh, you know, trying to cut away from your intake, then it, it's time to start uh, listening to the common sense in you that probably has been speaking to you for the past, uh, you know, however long they've been doing this. So if you're really feeling something, you, you need to go out and seek of, of other people and just kind of ask questions. Um, because it really is important to try to fix this rather than stick it out and make the condition way worse. Uh, again, because this timeline can be extended extremely long. There, there was actually 
uh, a study in uh, individuals with anorexia and bulimia who were three years post recovery and they still did not have restored metabolic rates. Um, so again, this is food for thought. Um, this stuff takes a really long time to recover and there's no guarantee that you know you're going to get back to normal potential if, if you've really offended your body. <laughs> um, so again, like I said, don't attempt to hit the ground running. Don't think that you know you're going to create a 1,500 calorie deficit so you can lose three pounds a week. Um, anything crazy like that. If it seems crazy, if you feel like you're going to go nuts on a diet, that is a red flag. There's a reason you're experiencing that. Um, again, don't expect change overnight. There's a reason that all these fad diets exist. Things like Physicians Weight Loss, where they put you on 800 calories. Um, and, and throw a bunch of supplements at you so you don't basically tank out and, and caffeinate the heck out of you. Um, it's because they can keep you on these plans because what do you ever learn in the long run um, from, from going through them? Nothing. So basically you go back to normal eating, your, me your metabolism is bombed out, and you gain all your fat back on significantly reduced calories. That doesn't help anybody. Um, and, and most importantly, it doesn't help you. You feel lost. You feel frustrated. It's, it's just, it's terrible. Um, so again, try to to think of the common sense approach to things and ask questions. Seek people out if you don't know the answers. Um, and again, something to really appreciate here is it does take time to go from thin to fat. Um, when you gain weight, most people don't gain 20 pounds of fat in a week. Don't expect to lose 20 pounds of, 20 pounds of fat in a week. Um, so being patient and consistent is really the key to doing things healthfully. That's it. Again, like I said, hopefully that was, um, that was interesting. Hopefully that made, that spurred some thought in some people. Um, hopefully none of that was offensive to anybody. Um, I really just, you know, wanted to get some more information out there. Uh, again, this was kind of made to to compliment um, on Lane's video. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, my email is denovoprep at gmail.com. And also check out my sponsor, Outwork Apparel. They have awesome stuff. And also check out the Denovo website. I will be adding more of these type of videos, um, really in all different areas. I plan on doing squat and bench and deadlift form videos next, and um, just a lot more of these to kind of just uh, speak my mind on topics and, and hopefully be beneficial to people. Thank you for listening, guys.